recording video, are we? No. Okay. So, hello everyone. Hello. So, this is the section that's next to the bar. <laughs> so, I don't know what that says about what they think of either me or you. Here we are. Um, I'm not sure where I am tomorrow, but I'm also going to talk tomorrow. Wouldn't be surprised if it too is the size of our We'll be all right. My name is Stephen Downs. This is personal learning versus personalized learning, what needs to happen. And I was given some explicit instructions before doing this presentation. One was to allow some time for questions, so I'm going to do that. And the second was to limit it to three or four key points. I'm going to try structured it that way, but I will not be held responsible if there are more key insights to be found in this talk. Um, Stephen, yes. I, I have a question off the top. I have a question off the top. Wonderful. Wonderful. You, uh, I'm assuming uh, we have slides available. There are slides. And, oh, and the address isn't on the slide. I wonder why that is. The, uh, the slides are available on my website at www.downs.ca I thought it was on this slide deck. I wonder what else is not on this slide deck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, www.downs.ca slash presentation slash 497 Like that. Really thought that they were. Oh, I see what happened. They're on the version that's on that computer, not on this computer. But uh, anyhow, those slides are available for immediate download. Uh, they're on SlideShare, so you can follow along if you want. I don't have a back channel ready for this, but uh, I will for tomorrow. It's just too much logistics involved in doing all of that for this one today. So. Any other questions before I get going? Did you, did you find it all right? Oh, no, I didn't. Uh, I'm not going to be too Oh, you're not connected. Okay. Yeah, bad. You, you won't need an internet connection. Yeah. You're good? Okay. Yeah. So, this bit, if you've seen my talks before, you've probably seen this bit before, and, but it always bears repeating. This is the distinction between personal versus personalized learning. And just uh, as a quick aside, that's the new mural that they're doing down on the old Chum TV station, which is now part of Bell Media. And it's funny because I remember back when it was Chum and, uh, and, and so the murals and everything about that place was really edgy and weird. And now we have innocuous corporate art going up as a mural which just characterized to me the difference between personal and personalized learning. I um, don't know if it resonates quite the same for you, but edgy art, personal. Right. Inoffensive corporate art, personalized. Anyhow. So let's set this up. Uh, there's two approaches to learning. Okay, there's a gazillion approaches to learning, but I'm going to overgeneralize and break them down into two approaches. One starts with the content you need to learn. The other starts with the thing it is that you're trying to do, which I would call practice. The content-based approach is the approach that most of us are familiar with, right? There are some learning objectives, there are some competencies, whatever. Content. And then you learn the content, and then that generates some kind of outcome or practice. So you do a test, you do an assignment, whatever. On the other hand, if you're starting with trying to do something, you go out, you try to do it, that generally produces some kind of result, some kind of content. You try to paint and you create your first painting, and it's all on the flip, it's okay, you produce some content. So you see the difference between the two approaches, right? So there's a whole different ontology 
involved with each of these two different states. On the content-based approach, really you're beginning with some kind of ideal content state that you're trying to achieve. You know, think of it as the, uh, the, the Platonic or Pythagorean ideal form of learning. You're trying to get perfection of some sort. On the other hand, when you're trying to do something, you're just trying to get to some sort of desired state. You're, you're trying to paint, you're trying to plant a garden, you're trying to build a dog house that won't offend your dog, whatever, right? The standards are a bit looser. Uh, the standards are you just trying to get something done. On the ideal model, where you begin with content, this ideal thing, when you produce your result, whatever it is, that comes in the form of some kind of test. And the person who's there to help you, the teacher, the evaluator, whatever, will test you. Compare that to what happens when you're just practicing something, trying to get something done. If there's another person involved, you know, it's not their job to tell you it's an ugly dog house. It's their job to help you build a better dog. You see, the roles are different. The ontology is different. The roles are different. Perfection versus practice. Measurement against the standard versus help to do something better. And in the testing model, they will test you. They will find you wanting. They will <coughs> perceive a gap between what you have been able to do and what that ideal state is. And there's almost always a gap. Um, and they will offer some kind of correction. As compared to if you're trying to do something and the person's helping you out, then that counts as, if you will, a try. And an opportunity is created to try again. And you'll iterate through these tries, getting better and better and better. Throughout my presentation, you'll see my photographs scattered. And my photographs are a good illustration of this. When I first started photography many years ago, they were really bad. <laughs> but, you know, and from photo to photo, you don't discern a meaningful difference. But after 30,000 or so photos, I think they're getting pretty good. And that's what happened. And, you know, somebody could have been there and said, come on, your photo is not a Yosef Karsh. And, you know, at the age of 15, I would have said, well, yeah, right? No, maybe you can compare me to Karsh, but I'm not trying to be Karsh anymore. So. Anyhow, the content-based approach, just in terms of pedagogy, organization, and structure, is a library-based approach. We think of what we're up to as, you know, sliced and diced in a linear fashion, a set of books on a shelf, the domain to be covered, as compared to, well, I, I like to think of the other approach as an environment kind of approach. Uh, you're in a place where you're doing something, a lab, a workshop, a photography studio, although they don't have those anymore. But they used to, when I started, I had to my own pictures. Now, yay, digital photography. Uh, so the whole learning experience See the difference between the two? Is it kind of clear? Now, the content-based approach is personalized learning. Personalized learning is about you finding the quickest, best, shortest, whatever, path to some kind of predefined content. Usually competencies, although not necessarily, uh, or some sort of skill base, or some sort of requirements base, perhaps, uh, for mandatory training or whatever. That's a very tall flashbulb. <laughs> That's the second tallest flashbulb I have ever seen. I always wanted to do that too. <laughs> I'm dating myself. Um, there are places for personalized learning. Small places. Uh, people talking about the 80-20 theory, right? 80% of learning is informal, 20% is formal. 
personalized learning falls into that 20% that's formal. You're learning against standards, you're learning a body of content, you're dealing with structured uh, information environments, etc. I am way more interested in personal learning, which is the 80%, which is the practice. And I think, and this is the challenge for you, if you reflect on your own practice, yeah, okay, you take some courses. Um, but mostly, and by now as professionals, almost entirely, your learning is based on personal learning. I want to talk for the second, the big long part of the presentation, about what that means, what that is. But have we laid out the foundations all right? Does that make sense? Clear is crystal. <coughs> Clarity is important to me. The presentation before they gave us writing samples from Shakespeare. I remember why I hate Shakespeare so much. <laughs> you have to read it two, three, four times to figure out, oh, okay, he's just saying, never mind. <laughs> he's just saying something dirty. I get yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Shakespeare. So I view personal learning, not surprisingly, personally. And I want you to reflect on personal learning personally. But, you know, give clear instructions for the presentation, make it pragmatic and practical. So I also want you to think about how we're going to make personal learning work for everyone else. The people in your company, in your training department, in your school, your grad school, your university, I don't know, we have K-12 people here, anyone? In your K-12 school? Uh, this matters at all levels of learning, believe it or not. Quick aside, I'm a child of the 70s. In Ontario in the 70s, they tried experimental progressive learning. Yeah. And then the outcome of that. <laughs> <laughs> we had electives, we had open concepts, we had, you know, define your own learning. Uh, look what happened. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, I've, as instructed, identified three major key insights or themes, but I'm only going to reveal them one at a time because suspense. <laughs> First one is choice. You probably knew that coming. It's hard to believe that that's a controversial thing, but it is. Uh, because, you know, the, the story always is that people don't know what they don't know, etc. Um, but choice is the first and key element of personal learning. I'll talk a little bit about that. When I learn, I make my own learning decisions. I do. Now, I don't just come up with stuff from out of, the, out of thin air. My learning choices are related to my current projects. For the last year, I've been immersed, deeply immersed in blockchain and distributed ledger technology. Not the hype stuff, but the actual nuts and bolts underneath that makes it all work. Now, I'm just a few months short of 60 years old. Right? I can choose what I want to learn. And more importantly, I can learn because I can make that choice. Uh, it was suggested to me in my workplace, this might be something you're interested in. You think you'd be interested in looking into this for us and you know, passing it around the department? And I said, that's true. I'm not doing anything else. Yeah, okay, that's not true. I was doing other things. But still, it did catch my imagination. They asked me nicely. And so I thought, sure, why not? That's all the difference in the world between them coming and saying, look, no more e-learning. You need to be a blockchain expert from now on. And I'd be sitting there saying, well, I'm 60 years old. I'm not going to be a blockchain expert. I'm going to retire an e-learning person. So, uh, you know, it's all about the choice, right? Um, has to do with my career choices. This is especially important when you're younger. All through my career I learned, all through my career I made choices. My choices were based on my estimation of my future career, not my employer's. As the old saying goes, and it dates back to the old British Navy, one hand for the ship, another hand for yourself. And I've always believed in that attitude. Uh, it's based on opportunities, 
needs, etc. You know, I was building cells. I needed to learn how to build shovels. I learned all about cookie joining from the internet. Okay, so what do we need to do to make that happen? Well, the quickest and easiest thing, I mean, you don't just magically wave your hands and say, ha, ah, you've got a choice now. That's silly, and it's not a strategy. Uh, what we need are systems that show the relation between specific learning goals and career choices, say, or specific learning goals and personal objectives or whatever. Give people the map. Uh, you know, if you're in a workplace and somebody indicates that you know they might be interested in management, then lay out the path for them. <laughs> well, you need to be able to do uh, budgets and projections. Uh, you need to be able to do staffing in HR. Uh, you need to be able to do project and program management. <coughs> so you'll need to develop capacities and all of these things. Whether you do it or not, it's totally up to you. But that's the path. That's what I mean. Very often, that path isn't laid out to people. So they may have ambitions. They may want to be management. They may want to be principal researcher. They may want to be chief surgeon. I guess the path for that's pretty clear. Uh, but they don't get the path laid out. This is especially true when people are younger and they don't necessarily see the connection between what they're doing now and what they might want to do. You want to be an astronaut? You need to learn trigonometry. Why? Well, you remember that act, that rocket that just blew up? What saved those astronauts? Trigonometry. It's true. I make my own learning decisions. I choose how I'm going to learn. I choose what I'm going to learn based on my previous experience, my learning preference, whether or not I trust the source. In Harvard Business School, not so much. Uh, and my needs. Other people trust Harvard Business School, not me. Uh, and this is really important. I'm sure you've all gone to a class teaching you something that you have just finished lecturing in the previous day. Um, I know I have. Uh, you know, critical thinking for the workplace. I used to teach that uh, in logic class, and now I'm taking it as mandatory training. Um, so we need to be able to make our own learning decisions. So how do we support that? Notice the dramatic pause here as I invite you to think for yourself about how to do that. Well, narrow the choices. Give people help. Um, that image is an image of big data. I, I know it's a slogan nowadays, but uh, with enough insight into the sorts of things a person prefers, uh, the type of learning people like to learn from, even the simple things like the language that they speak, uh, the websites that they prefer, the contacts that they prefer, etc. You can narrow a very wide range of choices into something a lot more now. No. Uh, Me, tech videos, not so much. Not interested. Um, but detailed YouTube videos on how to construct a Sterling engine, love those. And that's the sort of thing that a recommender system should provide for me. Now, by that I don't mean Netflix, uh, because you know, when you watch one Elvis film, Netflix will suggest every Elvis film that ever existed. And you'll never break out of that. Or, you know, the music services that burden you with uh, recommendations to you listen to country music for the rest of your life because you listen to Dolly Parton once because she was doing a brand new parallel cover and you like a parallel. Anyhow, we can do better than that, right? The, the tools aren't there yet. They're getting there, and in your practice, in your workplace, in your learning place, you should be looking for those tools that draw on personal background and experience to help make learning recommendations. That's a tall order. That's a, a not here yet, but watch for it. I make my own learning decisions in the sense that I design my own learning environment, just like I like to design my own office. Uh, you know, just like I get to decorate my own bedroom and my own kitchen. Uh, that's important to me. It's the tools and the environment that I'm comfortable with. But it's not just that. It's 
being able to relate my learning to everything else that I'm doing. My learning environment connects with activities outside the workplace, outside uh, the university or the college. It connects into my social network, even though, and believe it or not, my social network extends beyond the National Research Council where I work. My, I know. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> And, and I actually learn from people outside our organization. Our computer services people aren't happy with this, uh, but they learn to live with it. Um, my, I, you know, again, over a forest, I listen to music while I work and learn. So I like to have a soundtrack available to me, preferably right in my learning environment so I don't have to mess around with Google Music, which takes forever to load. And it's a little bit untrustworthy, anyways. Uh, you know, your preferences may differ, but what's important is being able to just set things up the way you want. And so, as providers of learning, you need to give people something more or less like a personal learning environment. Now, me, I built one because that's what I do. Uh, so that's my personal learning environment. If you look closely, I even have to listen for my soundtracks because I wanted one. Um, and that's the sort of thing we want to be able to provide for our learners. Because your learning management system connects to social networks and chat outside your institution and outside your learning management system. Mine does. So that my discussions can include my wider learning community because that's who I want to talk to, not my managers. I really don't want to talk to my managers. I'm not locked in a box when it comes to learning. Really important. I choose learning from different institutions, different learning platforms, from multiple perspectives. Yes, even Reddit. Yes, even Red State. Can you believe it? I read Red State. Uh, yeah, I know that Red State exists. So, you know, uh, many different communities, um, you know, from people all over the world. That's the kind of learning that actually works for me. As compared to your typical learning management system where your learning is all coming from one source, one provider, and you see your own institution. You need to be looking, in my view, at ways of giving your learners, your employees, your students choice, even if that choice of learning is outside your own institution. That's hard. Institutionally, that's hard. And I know that's hard. I've spent quite a bit of time in the last year working with Canada School of Public Service. And Canada School of Public Service offers courses to public service working across Canada, to government employees. Do you think they want to give learning to government employees that originates from outside the government? No. But they know they have to because they can't create, or there's not, there is not now or ever going to be a Government of Canada course on Python. Which is not going to happen. So if you want your employees to learn Python, you have to make these external sources available. And not as, you know, like a, a one-week Python boot camp in Las Vegas. That's just not too practical. Oh, that's how it was done well within my lifetime. Your second major theme or insight, ownership. And it kind of falls out of the first one. Ownership is a really hard thing for educational institutions to deal with. Really hard thing. I don't know why I put direction in there. It's just I like the place. And it's you know, kind of jazzy sometimes. I feel comfortable there. I should have put it in for an environment. Uh, I'm not locked in a box when I do learning. Um, I use multiple learning technologies. I talked about the YouTube videos of Sterling engines. Uh, I use animation. I use uh, for Python. I use something called Code Academy, uh, which is an interactive Python learning uh, environment. Pretty good. Taught me basic Python stuff before it really got into uh, libraries and things like that, which is the useful stuff. But um, 
I use a lot of third-party platforms for discussion and interaction. Flickr, twi uh, Twitter, I can see Twitter. Uh, YouTube, uh, Mastodon is a recent one I've been using quite a bit. I use games, I use virtual reality. Basically, I use whatever tool I think is appropriate for the job. I'm not locked into page turners with objectives and a quiz at the end. I couldn't learn that way. I, I think I used to learn that way once when I was young, but I stopped learning that way a long time ago. And I expect most of you stopped learning that way a long time ago. It's a crime to do that to people. Uh, so how do we make this work? Support multiple media. Um, even this conference, well, this conference is good in the sense that they're providing people with access to the PowerPoint slides, so yay. Uh, but where are the video recordings? Uh, I'm recording mine because that's what I do, right? I'm not locked in a box. So there will be, unless that computer breaks, uh, a video recording of this talk. I have back the audio just in case because I've learned I need it. Also because I learned there's a non-zero, actually a fairly significant percentage of people prefer the audio feed over the video. Because watching video while you drive to work, bad plan. <laughs> bad plan. Don't do it. But listening to audio while you drive to work, recommended. Uh, so, and so this means very often going beyond your in-house learning management system, again, School of Public Service, they were using L, they were using Kaltura, they were using Moodle, they were using Drupal, all of these things to support the different types of media. Even that wasn't enough, but at least they had the right idea, right? At least they had the idea, look, we can't depend on one system, we need to have multiple systems for multiple, multiple forms of media so that people can access and use their kind of resources in their own way. I'm not locked in a box. My learning resources don't sit on the learning management system. My learning resources, for the most part, sit on my own website, except where I'm too cheap to buy storage. In that case, my learning resources sit on YouTube, or on Flickr, or on Dropbox, and it's interesting that is where the conference is hosting the uh, slides, good plan. Um, this online storage is almost free these days. Uh, you know, cloud, various cloud storage services, etc. Um, I don't really care where I keep my resources, I just like to keep them handy. And if you haven't heard it elsewhere, hear it from me. How does it go? Hear me now, believe me now. <laughs> Back up your content. Oh That's sort of silly, but um, I back up everything. Uh, two local sources and one remote source. And you might think, that's overkill. But I've had two hard drives go down in a single day. Uh, two big hard drives go down in a single day. It can have a one electrical storm. Uh, and, and there go all your photos. So fortunately, I had them on, on the cloud as well. So, uh, but the key thing here is these resources, these presentations, these essays, uh, these assignments, the photos, the videos, everything I've done through a whole career, they're mine. Oh, okay, someone else might technically own them, um, like my employer or whatever, but they're mine. I need them, um, and I expect to be able to keep them. Certainly the stuff that I did as a student, all of those essays that I wrote that were read by one person, uh, they're mine, and I have them, and eventually they'll all go on one. So how do we make that happen? Well, first of all, and this is the hardest thing, recognize that people own the stuff that they've created. Now, there's different ways of looking at it, right? Uh, there's legal ownership, which is copyright and all of that. But in Europe, certainly, there's the concept of moral ownership. And then there's also the concept of stewardship. 
And it's this last thing I think that's most important. Um, by enabling people to have and manage their own resources, you put them into the hands of the people who are most likely going to maintain stewardship of these resources. Uh, you know, companies and institutions are notorious for simply deleting entire websites. Uh, the University of Manitoba part of the world's first massive open online course, for example, white because they didn't have any future use for it. The stuff that I made uh, on my side still exists. So stewardship is important, but in order to support stewardship, you have to enable ownership. I can learn openly. Uh, by this, what I mean is not only do I use open educational resources, in other words, free resources that I can use, copy, share. Look, for example, all the images in this slide, uh, slideshow that are not my own photographs. I just borrowed those from the internet. I did my search. I made sure that they were licensed for reuse. And then I used them because that's what they're there for. Um, but not just that. I make my own open educational resources as well. So the photos that are on my presentation are or will be also on my Flickr site, are and will be also licensed for uh, reuse by other people so that if they want to use my picture, they can. Uh, again, institutions are often pretty proprietary about the stuff that's created by their own staff. I've had long, you know, years, decades long discussions with my employer about the, the licensing status of my own work. But I put everything on my website and I license everything as uh, Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial. And that satisfies them and it satisfies me. That way, I've made it available for reuse, which is really the main thing here. Um, and what's key here is, it's my choice. I can choose to license these openly, or I can choose to maintain proprietorship over them. Uh, it is ultimately up to me, so I'm not a fan of mandated open access, at least on, on a policy basis. As, as a funding criterion, perhaps, as a, as a point of policy, you know, if you, if you make people share, you've removed their ownership, and I'm not comfortable with that. Um, to make this happen, at all levels, this is a slide from the K-12 people because it comes from Wesley Pryor, who works in that system. Uh, create methods that help people create and share resources as they learn. Uh, my experience has been that working and learning openly significantly improve learning. Um, and there's a simple reason for that. If your stuff is going to be read by a hundred people as opposed to one, you'll probably put more effort into it. But also, just the act of not simply consuming something, but working with it, shaping it, doing something with it, also leads to better learning. And by better learning, I don't mean better, better memorization. I mean better comprehension or better capacity to use whatever it is that I'm learning about in order to do whatever it is that I'm trying to do. Uh, support sharing networks like uh, RSS or Web Mentions. Uh, even support sharing on social media. I, I know everybody loves to hate Instagram these days. I know I do. Um, but uh, it's a way for people to create and share. But give them alternatives. One of my favorite sites, I have a slide on, a slide on it later, is called DeviantArt. It's so much better than Instagram. It's, and it's, it's edgy, it's out there, uh, and, and once your students discover it, they won't want to go back to Instagram because, you know. Um, and there are lots of sites like that around. There are places to share that aren't just your typical Facebook home social network sites. I can learn openly in the sense that 
My learning achievements are visible to whomever I choose to make them visible to. And that sentence there is kind of awkwardly constructed. Um, I put the very top of my CV there. What's significant about my CV, besides it being great, uh, no, is that it's automatically generated because I got tired of writing my CV. And I thought, this is stupid. I've actually written the entire paper, and now I have to retype the title and call the film. Uh, so I, I set up my system so that it automatically generates my CV. That makes life so much easier for me. Not that I'm applying for lots of jobs, but you know, every time there's a new project, every time we have a new partner, they all want to see your CV. So there it is, it's referring to the page. And I don't need to worry about what kind of state it's in. It's automatically up to date. This seems like a simple thing. But here's the counter example. I've been with NRC since 2001. Um, I went to our training department and asked them for a list of all the courses that I've taken in those 17 years. Guess how many they found? One. Wow. <laughs> it turns out they, didn't, they weren't keeping track. Well, they were keeping track, but in different departments, and then with mergers and reorganizations and different groups over the years, they kind of lost track of it all. Uh, it's not the only thing they've lost track of. Uh, when we create new inventions, we uh, submit something called a Form 1. Uh, a Form 1 is basically a register of uh, a novel idea or invention by a member of the public service. Guess what else they lose track of? Why? Because it's hard to keep track of these things if they're just sitting as documents on shared drives somewhere. So there needs to be a mechanism. You need to support a mechanism that automatically keeps track of people's learning in such a way that they have access to it and in such a way that it tracks all of their learning, not just the learning that you provide. That's what's going to make it hard. Because it means you have to cooperate with the other departments or the other institutions that are providing learning. And to date, from my experience, nobody wants to do that. Um, I don't know why. Why do you know why? It's, but this is what you need. And I think that the best place to do it is to put the software into the hands of individuals that will automatically track their learning, track and report their learning, their production, their output, their projects, their degrees, their certificates, automatically. We're beginning to get there. Uh, people have been talking about badges, digital badges, and things like that. These credentials have been around for a while. We're just on the cusp of making that system actually work. There is a badge standard, there is a micro-credential standard. These things are being recognized by IMS and other technology agencies. And you should be looking at, I mean, I'm not saying everybody should go out and do badges because that would be stupid. Um, but what I am saying is everybody should be looking at standardized mechanisms for representing credentials, achievements, certifications, etc., And that the people doing this should be not just educational institutions, but HR departments, publishers, conference organizers, any, any institution that has to do with something that somebody is doing. Professional organizations. Uh, in um, Don Prezant's talk the other day about badges, he, he referenced uh, organizations like CGA, etc. that have already multiple levels of uh, accreditation and all of that. So what's the standard way of representing those in such a way that I can just link my web page to them and show them? It's not there yet, but it's coming if that's short term. Third major insight, drilling down to getting us able to have some Q&A time. I can learn openly. and. This is a change for companies and schools. My learning community 
doesn't follow my school, it doesn't follow my employer, it follows me. And conversely, I follow other people, not schools, companies, or employers, or whatever. Uh, my learning community is person to person, not institution to person. And I think that's really important. When I'm learning openly, when I'm sharing what I'm doing, I'm sharing with other people. And it's at this person to person level that sharing works best. If I take the course, my idea of learning and community is I'm able to stay connected to them after the course. Very often, you know, you take a course in a traditional learning management system, the course and community is killed. I've been complaining about that for 15, 20 years, yet it still happens. Um, if I leave, you know, if I leave university, I've left behind access to my learning management system and anything I put on my learning management system. That just doesn't seem right. And what's really important, you know, I mean, I've, I've often talked about this as the Yale advantage. Uh, the thing that Yale offers as a service isn't the content, isn't even the teachers, isn't even the IV walls. It's access to this network of other people who were privileged enough to get into Yale, whereby this network survives the departure of the institution and follows you through to your professional community. Eli's looked after Eli's out there in the world. You can see evidence of that all over the place. Right? Well, everybody should have that. Everybody should have their network that follows them after school or after employment with a company or whatever. So we need to support that and, and be explicit in permit, permitting and allowing that. Uh, one good example of this is Shopify, which is offering meetups, and, and I've learned by looking at it, it's a wider program than I thought. I've just been attending them in town because they're cool and interesting. Not because I like Shopify. So well, I'm feeling better about Shopify now. Um, you know, but they just they you know these, I go to the graph uh, meetup, graph workshop meetups because I'm interested in graphs, and they get people from all over the community. They come, we go to the lounge on the sixth floor of Shopify. We talk about graphs, and somebody will do a presentation. We all have a good time. That's learning that it's staying outside my institution. That's the way to do it. This is something that any of you can do uh, and, and maybe should. I'm connected. I'm never alone. I talk, I talk a lot about personal learning and autonomous learning and the reaction is always, but how can you learn on your own? You don't even know what to do. But I'm not alone. Um, I've got a network of connections, a mastermind, a little bit less on Twitter, not at all on Facebook because I hate Facebook and I don't use it anymore. But the main point here is I follow other people as they're doing the same things that I'm doing and we learn from each other. And most of my ideas come from that network. I like to think I'm super original and all of that and pat myself on the back. But really, the network is the source of these ideas. I just put them together. They also help me. Not as much as I'd like, but and not as well as I'd like, but you know, the help is there when I need the help. I wish it was better, but at least it's fair. Uh, anybody who works on um, coding and that is familiar with Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is where you land when you look for help about some ridiculous piece of coding that's not working for you. And you, you, you get an error message, you take the error message, you put it in the Google search, you search on that specific error message, and more often than not, Stack Overflow will show up as your search result. Somebody else had that problem, and then you get your answers ranked in order of likelihood of being true. Uh, it's a brilliant system. It works beautifully, and Stack Overflow has gotten me through more hard programming problems than you can imagine, than I can imagine. So support this. Um, encourage people to contribute to Stack Overflow. Encourage people to work openly and share what they know. 
I very often, if I'm doing a coding project, I'll, I'll blog about it as I'm doing it. And I'll write about oops, what went wrong, why it went wrong, how I fixed it, etc. If people are doing this sort of thing, recognize and reward it. I know it's hard enough even to have teaching recognized as an activity in universities. But here, this is recognizing teaching outside the normal domain of the university class being recognized in the universities. Uh, it took me, uh, I don't know, 10 weeks, 10 years, or something like that, before NRC actually encouraged and supported me in doing my MOOCs. And, and the one that I'm starting, that I'm launching tomorrow, is the first one that NRC has, is explicitly endorsing. I consider that to be as important as the actual development of MOOCs in the first place. And getting a government or organization to support informal teaching outside the community in really a very messy way is incredible. And, and uh, makes it worth getting up and going into the office in the morning. That's the kind of thing that needs to be supported. Um, and, you know, it comes back to the institution, it comes back to the organization, both in terms of new things learned through the process and, of course, better relations and being able to better serve the community. I'm connected. My learning evolves and grows day by day. As the world changes, my learning resources change. I put up a picture of weather because weather is a really interesting thing. Unlike all other kinds of news coverage, on the weather map they actually show you why they're thinking what they're thinking. Well, there's a cold front moving across here. It's going to interact with this warm front. And as you know, when they interact together, an included front, that usually means hail, it usually means rain. There's a probability of precipitation. I wish the news was like that. You know, instead of just, you know, he said, she said. But the point here is that by showing this open link, by being able to see what they're looking at, you can see on the map that they show you the patterns and the trends. You can look at a weather map now, and even if the sound is turned down, you can probably predict the weather because you've gotten used to recognizing those patterns, right? I bet you you can all predict the weather from the weather map, even though you've never learned how to do it. So you, we want the same sort of thing for learning. Dashboards, visualization tools, access to AI as a service, all of this is coming. All of this is just on the cusp of being available. We talk about learning analytics a lot, but it's always learning analytics for the instructor, right? It's always learning analytics for the institution. We should be thinking learning analytics fed <coughs> back to the learner in the form of a learning dashboard. That's the kind of technology that I want. I'm connected in the sense that I can track and understand my own progress. That's somebody else's Strava because I have never made a great big heart in San Francisco with a bicycle. I never thought I'd say that in a talk. Um, but I use Strava and I use it to track my own cycling activities. And, you know, it's one of these things. When you're tracking your cycling, you tend to do more cycling, which is good for you. Um, I can see the patterns. I can see my improvements. Uh, you know, I can see the records that I set for myself, the fastest going up. Uh, Moose Creek Mountain, they call it. Um, you know, a little faster each time. Um, and what's important is that I'm getting this from different platforms. Get it from Strava, but if I wanted to, I don't because I'm afraid. But I can also get, you know, a heartbeat indicator or, or things like that. Um, you know, I certainly use GPS to support Strava, so it's actually a constellation of devices working together to give me this picture. So this is what we want: quantified self, personal ownership of data, tracking what's important, tracking from different platforms, but not for the institution but for the individual. It's not about you owning the data and leveraging that data in order to, I don't know what, enforce competencies? Like that's a learning goal. It's about putting this information back into the hands of the learner so that they can be uh, as effective and informed a decision maker as possible. I mean, people talk about uh, you know, the, the difficulty of making decisions and 
too much choice and all of that. That's a fallacy. Too much choice is a problem only if you don't know what you're looking for. You know, you've, you've all gone to uh, like a football game, right? Think about it. 30,000 people in the same place. Uh, I don't know, 50 people on the field. It's madness. You have no problem following what's going on, right? Because you know at least enough to follow the ball, right? Um, or the vendor of popcorn, whatever. Um, and that, that's the sort of thing. You can give people the support that they need, the information that they need, they can make their own decisions. So how we make that happen? Well, here's my story. This is my software that I'm playing with. Uh, ways to look for jobs, connect the jobs or contracts or projects to learning that I have to do. Register for a course, perhaps, in the same environment. Take courses from multiple providers in that environment. Read from whatever in my course, while I'm in my course, and be able to merge my reading from all over the place with the work that I'm doing in my course. Have this environment take care of my learning record for me, so I don't need to think about that. So, although I can look back on it, reflect on it, look at the patterns of my learning, etc. But I'm not worried about you know, filling silly lines in a CV. Uh, letting me interact with people, create my own meetings, interact with other people in their live meetings, webcast, whatever, or chat, social media with my friends, and so on. I did say I would allow time for questions. There is time for questions, not as much as I'd like, but uh, I'm going to be dashing out of here, or I like to stay here because um, I have uh, an online chat with George Siemens and the e-learning 3.0 course starting at 4 o'clock. There is time for questions now. That's my talk. Awesome. Thank you. Just going to focus on an assessment. So, uh, how in personal learning, mm -hmm. I can see personal learning as a component of a course, right? Which has personalized components, whether it's eighty percent or whatever. Let's say it's fifty fifty for sake of argument. How and if I'm if I'm interested in measuring skill based development, mm -hmm. how do I look at evaluating with the with the level of the environment you just described? How I would feel like it's a very subjective choice based on the choice the personal learner is making. In in their exploration of stuff. Are you saying that you can't, come, like they go and do personal learning, does it get evaluated out there? Do they come back into the personalized space and then they, they look at the same criteria as that? So you're still defining it as an ideal body of content that they need yeah. to learn and you want to evaluate them against that content. That might help you, it doesn't help them a lot. Uh, the, the real question I would ask in terms of evaluating learning is, was I able to complete the thing that I was working on? Right. For me, this often boils down to some very simple yes no questions. Does my code work? Did my shells hold together when I jumped on them? Um, how are my tomatoes growing? Um, is there's a my, spectrum there, right? There's pardon? a spectrum of how well your tomatoes are growing, right? There is. So there's criteria associated with how you could, in fact, grow better. No, there's, there are ways tomatoes could be better, and ways tomatoes could be worse. Uh, but there's also a cutoff, right? There's edible and inedible, uh, which might not seem like much, but when you're just starting out growing tomatoes, that's pretty significant. There are different ways tomatoes could be better, right? Tastier versus bigger is a classic one, right? So, I mean. You want to hold them to a standard, but there isn't a standard. So it sounds like the difference between like a pass-fail course versus a course where you get a numerical grade. No, it's the difference between getting what you want to be done to your satisfaction versus somebody telling you whether you're good or not. But the nature of higher education is that the accreditation given in that course translates to that person being able to do certain things in the workforce. Uh, that's, that's the theory. Uh, the practice suggests that that's probably not the case. I mean, we've all read for pretty much all of our adult lives about employers saying that uh, at 
academia it doesn't prepare people for the workforce, right? I mean, if you wanted to change, if you wanted the nature of the university to be such that it works well, you would take authentic workplace tasks and make those the outcome of a specific program or course of training. So, you know, um, do do a do a, a, a a project plan to the satisfaction of a manager or something that's actually going to be built, right? And, and, and if you've done work on project plans, you have never an ideal way to do a project plan, but every time you do a project plan, it's different because every time you're pitching to somebody different. You see the difference here? Yeah, it's like looking at the project base versus the relevance of the task that is under evaluation. But I don't, I'm trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. You're trying to fit it into a yeah, category. Like, right? I work at a university and I want the courses to get better. And I change the skills to be better. Like I'm measuring things like communication and empathy and critical thinking. But like it's, yeah, it's a hard thing to do to give them the freedom that we're talking about here. To, to make that DIY education plan and yeah. also give them the degree. Just remember, anytime you, like, like, educators love to categorize, educators love taxonomies. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and very often, that's what counts as research. Um, every time you do that, remember, a taxonomy or a categorization or anything like that, that's an abstraction. And every time you abstract, the nature of abstraction is not extrapolation. I know it may have been presented to you as that, but it's not. It's subtraction. You're removing data, right? You're making your information less precise, less accurate. Like, for example, I don't mean to pick on you, but it's you're talking. <laughs> um, you said, you know, like, uh, oh, so it's like project-based learning. Well, yeah, it is, but as soon as you categorize it, you broke all of this bit off and all of that bit off, and you eliminated it from your understanding of what it is. So the attempt to categorize it actually broke the concept in your mind. So the trick here is don't categorize it. Yeah, I, I mean, I love formal reasoning. I love formalism, variables, classes and categories, but they're artificial constructs that serve a purpose to make a machine work, but they're, they're not elements of understanding or comprehension. I was a little meta. <laughs> um, the very first point, I make my own learning decisions choice. Sometimes in order to practice a specific skill, sometimes we need basic information first. So technology training. Um, sometimes you need to know sort of how to search for different domains, etc. How to, what's in that. You know, so you need the basic skills first. Okay. Like how to click on I, I, I have a story. Of, I've used this story for the last 20 years because it's a real story and it really happened to me. Trigonometry. Okay. Now, as it turns out, if you're working in, you know, you're doing some designing in, say, C, computer programming language, and you want to rotate a cube on a screen, like, say, the board in Star Trek. <laughs> you need to know trigonometry. Because it won't work otherwise. You, you can't calculate where all the parts of the cube need to be. You have to use it. I studied trigonometry four times. I studied trigonometry in high school because I was going to need it. Didn't take it. I studied trigonometry in my one year of computer science courses at Algonquin College. Because I was going to need it. Did you take? I studied trigonometry in Math 101 at the University of Calgary because I was considered unqualified in mathematics to take my courses. Didn't take. I studied trigonometry while I was writing the code to rotate the cube. That's when I learned. Right. This it might be a necessary condition for the possibility of performing some task, but it's only learnable really when you're trying to perform that task. Or as, Seym as Seymour Papert once said uh, in a conversation, 
the fact that something is foundational is shown by the fact that it's needed when it's needed and not before. So, you know, people talk about foundational. What is foundational? Right? It turns out we don't know what's foundational until we need it and we notice it's missing. But the efforts to say, this set of things is foundational. You take a discipline, any discipline, and try to outline those foundational things. I will give you an alternative and equally important set of foundational principles. I can do that for any discipline, it's a fun exercise. Yes. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. I like keep telling myself, don't say, does that make sense? <laughs> well, because it's really rude, because it's like, I know everything, you know nothing. Yeah. Else. So, but don't do that. So, I, look, yeah. So, I should be saying, was my explanation adequately clear? But even that's kind of, anyhow. No, it's fine, thank you. <laughs> uh, how are we doing? 3.47, so... I would linger, but like I say, at 4 o'clock, I have the first live online session for my course with George Siemens. Is there anything in this room after, do you know? Oh, rats. Oh, I was going to do it right here. Well, I guess I'll have to leave. Can I get the link to your slides again? Sorry. Yes. www.downs.ca slash presentation. Four nine seven slash four nine seven. Thank you. You're welcome. Four nine seven, right? Four nine seven. No, I got it. I got it. Hey. Yes. Uh, possibly. I'm going to be kind of frantic. But...